Good evening, everybody. I'm David Gluckman, the president of the Cape Town Chess Club, and it gives me great honor to welcome all of you here tonight for a historic occasion. It's part of the Cape Town Heritage Chess Festival 2017, where we're having many events over this week related to chess. Uh, but tonight is a special night. It is the Leonard Ritstein Lecture on South African Chess History, and we're very honored to have Leonard himself uh, age 88 with us tonight, an honorary life member of the Cape Town Chess Club, a former president of the South African Chess Federation, and uh, someone who's been a leader in South African chess for many decades, and we decided we will name the lecture uh, after him. And maybe I'll just read a tribute that comes from this book, uh, The History of, South African, of Chess in South Africa by Leonard himself. It says, Leonard Ritstein is uniquely qualified to write this book. He was for years South Africa's Mr. Chess, with a background as player, organizer, including a stint as president of the South African Chess Federation, chess book collector, author, and above all, editor and publisher of the South African Chess Player. And that is by former Cape Town Chess Club uh, member, champion, and South African champion, uh, David Friedgood. So Leonard, welcome here tonight. We're very pleased to have you. May I say, I'll just put these down. These are three of the books that Leonard's written, uh, and people are welcome to peruse them, and if anyone wants to buy, we do have copies uh, as well, but I think a lot of you will have already. Okay, so that covers the basic introduction. Now, we've got three parts to this lecture tonight. Um, I'm going to speak on uh, Cape Town uh, chess scene from what I remember, my personal uh, story from the 1980s. Then we've got Watu Kabeza, many times South African champion, who grew up in Soweto, whose father was also a president of Chess South Africa, who will be talking about the chess scene in Soweto uh, and, and, and the life of his father as well, who many of us remember very well. And then finally we'll conclude uh, with uh, Lyndon Bauer, or Dr. Lyndon Bauer, Director General in the Department of Sports and Culture uh, of Western Cape Government. Uh, but also an Olympia chess player who will be talking about chess in the 1990s. So without further ado, uh, we're going to uh, move on to uh, my story of chess in, in the 1980s. Now there's my son Paul. I can see he thinks that was a long, long time ago. He doesn't really believe it exists, but let me start the story. In Cape Town in 1978, now I, although I was born in Cape Town, my family moved to Port Elizabeth in Joburg, uh, uh, and at 12 years old, I had my first connection to chess uh, in Cape Town when I came with the Southern Transvaal uh, team, primary school team, which was my first tournament, to play in Pinelands, uh, uh, Pinelands Primary School in uh, December of 1978. And there's a picture, a bit blurry, uh, from, from that. Uh, we then moved to Cape Town uh, in mid-1979, and I basically started playing chess uh, in Cape Town, uh, you know, in 1980. And I was here until about 1987 when I moved to Johannesburg. So I'm going to try to cover that, that period. Maybe I should just say, I'm going to cover it, I mean, at that stage, especially in Cape Town and, and the Eastern Cape, there wasn't uh, unity at all in South, South African chess. Uh, and for many uh, in this audience, I mean, we had two different worlds we lived in, and the two didn't really meet. Uh, so I can only talk from what I knew, the South African Chess Federation perspective. And I thought, given it's a history lecture, I'm not going to try to sugarcoat it or anything like that. I will just talk the facts as I, I remember it. So if I offend anyone, apologies, but I think history requires that we must tell the, the, what we actually remember the facts. So maybe t to move on a little bit, a little bit about my stories, I actually Soon after coming here, I joined the Cape Town Chess Club, which was originally situated, it's interesting we're at the Bridge Club, Western Cape Bridge Club tonight, because it was originally shared premises with the Bridge Club, and it was that side, the Regent Street side of, of Seapoint, and we used to go there. I don't remember what night of the week, it may well have been Tuesday nights, like, like we still meet. And then later on, it moved to the Seapoint Civic Center, which is right opposite uh, Ellerton Primary School, uh, where we now meet. Now meet. I must say, in those days, um, uh, you know, there was 
Bill, I, w- I was quite keen. I, I was at actually school with uh, Leonard's daughter, uh, Michelle, uh, but uh, there was a lot, lot, lot I used to do to try and improve, and I actually improved quite quickly because I only started playing at about 12 in tournaments, uh, but I improved from pretty much at 1980, about 1400 to about 2000 strength in probably about two and a half years uh, after that. And I used to go, I remember, to Juta's bookshop in town, and there you had a, quite a big chess collection now. You don't get that today, and I used to like read the books for free uh, in the in the bookshop. Uh, I remember in the 1981 SA Closed Championship, which Mark Rubri played in at the Herrenkracht Hotel in the center of town, I was a board boy. So I used to like make the moves so that the spectators could see them. I even did things like I played correspondence chess. I played in the South African Correspondence Chess Championship. And I think I came about fourth or fifth or so. Uh, and that would have taken place over two or three three years. And my coach was a chap who was also a teacher at my school, Howard Goldberg, but, uh, and he was with us last night at the dinner, but he didn't really coach me, we just used to play blitz, so I don't ever remember him coaching me anything. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but my first tournament I remember in Cape Town, uh, and probably was my first tournament, was after, after that SA Primary School, it was the Western Province closed in 1980, and I found this old chess column from 1980. Now, you won't see it very well, but I remember the tournament very well, because there were four or five sections, and uh, you can't see it yeah, all that well, but this was the top 12 sections, and I was playing in the fourth section over here. Interestingly enough, the guy playing with me in the fourth section was a chap, Mark Levitt, who went on to become South African champion himself. He actually won that section. So we were both pretty much beginners at that stage. But if you look at this table, this is after six rounds. There's a chap, Roger Shackers, who's leading the tournament with six out of six. Now, last night we had the discussion, or firstly, who, who would be the best ever South African chess player? That's one discussion. But we also had the discussion, who's the most talented? And Roger's name definitely came up uh, very highly. I rem- before my time, I know he drew to Raymond Keane, who's a grandmaster from England when he was 12 years old. And I know he also came fifth in the World Under-16 Championship, which Paul will confirm is quite, quite an achievement. And this tournament, which was a very strong Western Province close, I can see names like Jacques Salikoglo, Donald McFarlane, Jacques Sudan, very strong players. He ended, I remember very well, with 11 out of 11. It was, that is a superb achievement. Roger was 19 at the time. To be honest, that was the whole peak of his whole chess career. I don't think he played that much afterwards. He played occasional tournaments for the next decade. Uh, and stopped entirely. He's a, a, a doctor, I think. Is he still? With, does he work? Somewhere in Khateng, Well, Triangles. He's been working as a medical doctor there for, for many years. The other, um, r- uh, maybe just one other little story f- about Roger as well, why I think he's so talented is in 2002, plus minus, I happened to play him four games on the Internet Chess Club. Now, I must admit, I probably had a few beers before, but I was pretty much number one or two in the country at the time, and Roger beat me 4-0. Uh, on the night, which was quite impressive, actually, and I've never heard from him since. Uh, okay, and then, okay, maybe the other uh, recollection I have of chess in the 1980s was the Odemiester uh, 1980 knockout event, which was one of the biggest, or must be the biggest tournament ever held in South Africa, even bigger than the South African Junior Chess Championships, which today, you know, get close to two and a half thousand uh, juniors come to play in that. But the Odemiester 1980 tournament was a unique event. It was a knockout of every person in the country could enter it. And there were well over 3,000 uh, entrants in that throughout the country. And, and the knockouts were played throughout out, out the land. Uh, in Cape Town, I remember they were played at uh, what's now the Holiday Inn. Uh, where is it? Woodstock Way. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, you just turned up, you played, it was a random draw. Some people played very strong players in round one. There was often two, but some people got weak draws all the way right through. And then at the end, when it got to about the last 16, they flew them all to a central place in the country and they played knockout until they determined a winner. And in fact, I remember that uh, they used to have sports in South Africa and TV had just kind of started on a Saturday afternoon. There'd be like three, four hours of sports and the, the final they actually televised uh, for a few hours on that uh, sports channel, much to the annoyance of my cousins who were really <laughs> not impressed with this thing. Um, and in fact, if you went to the cinemas in those days, they actually, you know, before they used to show like 
things that have happened, etc. I don't know what Mirror International or something like that. And there were uh, the, the, the chess was in those as well. Now the guy who did best from Cape Town was Howard Goldberg, who got all the way to the semi-finals uh, before before being knocked out. And I must say, coming back uh, to this chess festival, I invited Eddie Price, the former uh, Olympiad player and president also of Chess South Africa, to come to this festival. And I told him what I was doing, and he did remind me that Mark Rubri was the chap who lost South Africa the Odomiester sponsorship when he refused to play in the essay closed for not enough prize money in 1985 and got an article in the Sunday Times and Odomiesta thereafter cancelled their, their sponsorship to South Africa Chess. And Eddie remembers this 32 years old, later, Mark. Um, 1980, also, uh, 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 quite, quite part of that scene was we often used to get in the car and go all the way to PE, many players and play in tournaments over there. And uh, the one tournament I remember very well was the 1980 SA Open in Port Elizabeth. Um, and one of the reasons I remember it very well is the first time I saw a player, Charles de Villiers. He had been studying in France, uh, and he came back and played that. And, and, well, of the South Africans, he won by a long way. And he quickly established himself as clearly the best player in South Africa and followed that up with a very convincing victory in the 1981 SA Closed in uh, Cape Town the next year. What I also remember from that though is uh, that 81 is a closed is I had a contemporary Donald McFarlane. Now I gave you um, the story of that first tournament actually when I went to the primary school tournament from flying from Joburg all the way to Cape Town in 1978 and I remember when our team was getting ready to get on the plane some people talked about this guy from Cape Town Donald McFarlane well, I'd never heard of him in my life before. We were 12, he's my contemporary, pretty much the same age. We were 12 years old, and he was already 1950 or 18 or so uh, at the time. So I met him at the primary school championship. He then, the next year at 13, played in the South African Closed Championship, which was in those days for the best 14 players in the country. And he did admirably, got about maybe four and a half out of 13. Mark, you would have played in that tournament as well. And he followed it up two years later in the 1981 essay closed by coming clear second. And then two years after that, at age 17 in 1983, he defeated Mark in a very long final game to actually win the South African Championship at age 17 when he was in matric. Unfortunately, Donald pretty much didn't play any time after age 19. But, I mean, his record stands for itself. He must be the best South African junior player ever. Uh, he won three SA Junior Championships in a row. He beat uh, Bishi Anand, who went on to become world champion when they were both juniors. Um, he played the SA close 13, second place at 15, and winner at 17, and basically stopped playing chess at 19. He also won the Australian Junior Championship along the way uh, as well. Um, in fact, I think I'm, I'm just trying to remember. So, in fact, this is a little uh, bit of history. It's a, it's a certificate I got in 1980 when I qualified to play for the Western Province High Schools team. Now in those days we didn't have under 8 and under 10 and under 12 and under 14 and under 16. And today, to be honest, you can be under 14 D team. It's not that difficult to make the Western Province uh, schools teams, you've actually got to say. In those days there was just one, one, one team of 10 for all of high school and one team of 10 for all of primary school. So there's more of an achievement, but you will see over here, this is the I, I got it, but Donald McFarlane won the, 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 the high school championship. He would have been in, uh, what was standard seven, grade nine at the time. It was 10 out of 10. Mark Levitt came second with seven and a half with the chap Neville for Lander. And I came maybe fifth, sixth with six out of 10. Um, so a little bit of history. And then maybe I'll just tell you, I was a little bit, I was quite, uh, I used to just try to do, do two different things. So the one time they used to have, well, they still have, uh, they had uh, exams to qualify as a tournament director or arbiter. So when I was 14, I wrote the exams and uh, I passed it. And you can see over there, I qualified. I've never actually directed a tournament, but I just did the exam for the hell of it. But it mentions that my father was also, because my father used to come to tournaments and he used to hang around and eventually he started um, uh, arbiting uh, or directing the tournaments as well. Um, in fact, what, what I remember from those days, a lot of the tournaments took place at the Claremont Chess Club, which is still a center of chess activity today. 
And uh, Ruben Salim of African Chess Lounge now runs the, 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 the premises of the Claremont uh, Chess Club. Um, uh, but you'll see over there, if you go over there, you'll see there still are the manual pairing cards on the walls where you, you know, pairings weren't done by computer in those days, they were done uh, uh, manually. So the Claremont Chess Club was the center of a lot of the activity. But I do remember like quite a lot of other hotels sometimes were used, not so much schools in those days. It, we used to use, the Ehrenkracht Hotel was used for the very fancy, like the SA Closed. The Ritz Hotel, the INC Point, was used quite often for things like Western Province Open and Arthur Seat Hotel as well. I think it's all because they're all part of the Protea chain who actually did quite a bit of sponsorship uh, in those days. Maybe while I was talking about manual uh, pairings, I just remember we also used to have lots of adjournments in those days, so the game would uh, end or be declared ended after four or five hours. You could go home and come back and play the next week. Now, adjournments got... Uh, terminated in the early 90s when computers became too strong and it, it would be pointless to do that. So the young players today know nothing about those, but uh, Watu and I discussed it, and I believe adjournments were a good way to improve because it forced you to actually spend a long time analyzing your games uh, if you wanted to win the game, basically. Um, yeah, I'm going to go on to the 1981 SA High Schools tournament that was held in Durban. Actually, I think that was a little bit of my breakthrough tournament. I, I wasn't, you know, I was pretty much in the middle of the, let's say, Western Province team, not, nowhere in the country, really. And I, I came fourth in that tournament, which was quite a good achievement for me. Uh, I must say that maybe I'll, I'll give a little bit of an incident that happened over there that I recall. Uh, and, yeah, maybe we can be a bit shamed by it. But in, for Western Province, we didn't have... Uh, well, we, we had one player in the team who was not uh, white, who was a chap, Theodore Buttress, at that stage. And we, he was not allowed to stay with us because of the Group Areas Act. So he had to stay uh, in the YMCA or, you know, somewhere in Durban, and we, had, we stayed somewhere else in Musgrave, I think it was. Uh, so we did, I remember, pick him up every day and take him to all the activities and the tournaments, go play putt-putt and bowling and everything, but he couldn't come to the beach with us and all, that, all those type of things. So it makes me think, actually, uh, and Lyndon, maybe this will come in what you're going to write on the uh, unification process or the history of chess, is Eddie Price tells me, and I don't know if it's true, he says there was a black book that Capsa used to keep of all the bad incidents that happened. So it would be very interesting to know if that existed and where is that book. And Eddie asked me if we can find out because he would love, love to see it. He's only heard about it. Um, maybe a little bit, I'll go on a little bit to 1982. So one of the trips to Port Elizabeth, uh, we went to play the Eastern Province Open. And I remember that tournament very well because, again, uh, I came second in the tournament uh, behind David Walker. Uh, but during that tournament, uh, Ewan Cromot ran out of the tournament uh, during midway during a game, and it was the birth of his son Alex, who today is quite a strong player himself. But I, I played a game in that tournament against a chap Neville Frilanda, and I I've, I've now played, I've saw my database well more than a thousand games, and I, I wouldn't say it's the best from a quality point of view, but I still say it's my favorite game. Uh, and I thought maybe I'll quickly show it to you. Uh, now, Neville was actually, you would have seen previously, uh, let's say if I go up, uh, he came second over there. So he was like regarded as the second best player to Donald McFarlane. And basically, we had a bit of a rivalry because I was starting to like overtake him, basically. And at one game, his father had accused me of cheating because uh, I used to get up and walk, play a move, walk around, chat, etc. Uh, so there was a bit of a rivalry. Uh, and let me just try to show you this game, if I can figure out how to do this, uh, just for a bit of fun. Um, so, so I won't go into any great analysis, but I was black in this game. So at this stage, he was rated 1925, and I was rated 1890, and we would have been 15 years of age uh, at the time. Uh, now, but I didn't know any openings, so I still think I don't know that many. Uh, uh, but in those days, actually, I had a reputation of being a bit of a like, coffeehouse player, an attacking player. I know like, later on it got changed to more technical and positional, but when I was younger, that wasn't the case. So, can you see the screen? I don't know if you can. So, I just think it's quite a nice little cute game. So, this was my little made-up opening. I used to play this quite often. 
not quite often, but occasionally, and if they played bishop d3, I would have played f5, and you get all sorts of complications that I'd seen Tony Miles play, and I just used to try this out, but that, this wasn't a, sorry, allowed there, so I'll just go back. So he played knight c3, I develop, and then he gets a whole lot of space with d5, but now I start to undermine the center, and I actually played this, this, this variation, this was this, this was the first time I played it, but someone saw me play it at Wayne Burson, and he tried to refute it and played it again against me, and we drew, I remember, a little bit after this tournament. Sorry, going back. So he took, and now I think I've got quite good development suddenly, so I don't think I played that all that well, but somehow maybe he shouldn't take on C6. I've got a bit of development, and now I'll start to attack. Bring the knight to the center, attacking that bishop, um, and I've got a nice bishop coming down on the diagonal from B7, so for me, it's natural now to start attacking. So the knight comes in, and then he goes there, and there's no way I'm retreating that knight. I'll just bring the, the queen in to carry on the attack. Uh, and if he's going to take on g4, I presume I'm going to go maybe knight f3, or knight takes g4. I'm not sure. I haven't really analyzed this for, for years. So knight f3, maybe, yeah. So he plays there, and then I play h5. Now he can never take that knight, because then this rook's going to enter the game as well, and he'll be killed. So he tries to bring the knight there, and then I put the bishop back. So now I've got all my pieces in the attack. I mean, you see the two bishops, the two knights, the queen, the rook on h8. Uh, so he's trying other things. And I remember I did this quiet move. I remember I had to think a little bit about that and force the bishop away. And then I played g5 to stop bishop f4, I remember because somehow bishop f4 can help with defense in some ways. And he tries this, and then I just go, yeah, knight f3 check, he's got it, take it. I go there, take, he takes, I take, kick there, and bishop takes, and he, he resigns. So I like that game, I must say. Uh, <laughs> now, I still reward it as my most fun game, let's say, of all, all thousand. Okay, so I'm going to carry, carry on a little bit. in. Uh, 1983, there used to be interprovincials sponsored by an uh, insurance company called Rentmeister. And every year, uh, Western Province used to send a team up to the interprovincials in Pretoria. Uh, that was a team, I think it was four, four in the open team. And they used to have one female and one junior in the team. And I, I played Lance Melech, a little four game mini match. That's my only match I ever played to determine the. Um, final, the junior player, but Lance ended up going to that. I actually think I won the match, and then they told me that I'm over age slightly, because I was a few months older th than him. Uh, I think I won it two and a half, one and a half, actually, if I remember. Uh, so I didn't go, but Howard Goldberg was in the team. I think Charles de Villiers was in the team, I'm pretty sure. P probably Donald and Jacques Salicoglo, something like that. But we, we, didn't have a, uh, uh, we didn't have many women players in Cape Town in those days. So we didn't have, I know they had to scramble about to, to find a woman player, so I won't mention her name. Uh, but she got zero, zero out of five or whatever uh, in the tournament. So I just remember Howard Goldberg, when he came back to Cape Town, he told me they should rather have brought along a prostitute because she, <laughs> she would have done just as well and it would have been better for team morale. <laughs> Um, okay, so I just want to talk a bit about Leonard Ritzin. Um, now, Leonard, uh, I used to often go to his house. He had a house in uh, Newlands there. Uh, uh, is it Upper Noreen or something like that? That's right. And he had a massive book collection, and he had the South African chess player. He had been the editor for about 30 years at that stage. I actually used to regularly, he got me writing for the SHS player. But I remember most going there Sunday mornings. And we used to go play Blitz, and uh, it was myself and Howard Goldberg sometimes. And, but it was really the older players. It was Leonard, it was Kenneth Kirby, who was South African champion. He would have been much older than you. You weren't so old in those days, Leonard. Uh, Jacques Sedan and Arnold Rubenstein, ex-South African player. And we used to play uh, Blitz on uh, Sunday mornings. Uh, I also remember like Jacques Sedan, you know, always smoking his uh, pipe. So the, I don't know if he did it in your house. He probably did, eh? Yeah, but, but I always associate that smell of uh, cigar tobacco with Jacques, Jacques Sedan uh, even today. Um, I must tell you, they used to tell me some Olympiad stories because Leonard had been captain of the uh, South African team at, at various Olympiads. Now, how do I get back into this? Yeah. So, 
Ah, sorry, maybe I'll I missed this. Uh, along the way, just the example, there used to be matches between Western Province and Eastern Province as well, friendlies. Okay, and then talking about Leonard, he edited the South African chess player. This is a copy for those of you who haven't seen it, produced for 35 years or so, and every month there used to be uh, stories uh, and articles about various events. But I want to go to the 1964 for Olympiad, which was in Tel Aviv. And Leonard, I think you would have been the captain of the South African team, non-playing captain at the time. And uh, that was the one match South Africa, it says on this magazine versus Russia, but it would have been versus the USSR at the time. And South Africa that day played a team with three world champions in the team. They would have had Petrosian on board one for the USSR. They had a Botvinnik, former world champion, on board two. And they had a Spassky, future world champion, Smyslov. Stein played, but he's not world champion. But Spassky was the other one who played. Spassky played in that, 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 that yeah. Uh, but Kirby who used to come to the Sunday morning plates, happened to be the one who played Botvinnik. And so I remember them telling me the story of this photograph of Kirby playing Botvinnik. And at the Olympiad, um, uh, Kirby went to buy multiple copies of this photograph the next day. And uh, Leonard, the joke was that someone had asked us, maybe it was you had asked Kirby, how many pictures do you think Botvinnik bought of that <laughs> match? But I uh, hadn't felt asking, okay. And there, but there was another story which I did tell Leonard a few years ago, and you didn't know anything about Leonard. It was published when the KGB uh, files were released from that period, you know, after the fall of the Soviet Union is that there was a big discussion on that day before the match of whether the USSR would play their match against South Africa or whether they would boycott the match. Um, and uh, they were discussing it and uh, basically the leaning was towards boycotting the match. It actually means nothing. It was the preliminaries. The USSR would have won and got through to the finals easily, even with a 4-0 defeat to South Africa by default. Uh, but basically Botvinnik decided now he's going to play and he walked into the plane hall and the others didn't know what to do and he was the former world champion and the patriarch of Soviet chess so they all followed him into the hall and played the match. Um, okay, talking about Grandmasters, I do remember 1981 where there was the uh, big tournament with Korshnoy in South Africa, Nunn, Anderson, Hubner. The last three came to Cape Town and they played various simultaneous events and I remember I played in the afternoon at Bishops, I played Nunn uh, he played you know, school children and I got a draw there and in the evening I played Anderson and lost very quickly actually. Um, uh, and it, but Hubner played the top 10 players in Cape Town uh, uh, simultaneously and he won nine and a half half. Only Charles got a draw uh, in, in that match. I think 81, yeah. And then the, the next grandmaster to come to Cape Town was Quintero was quite a lot weaker than those, those other guys in 1987. He played a simultaneous year. And actually, I was the one player to beat him in that, that simultaneous anyway. Um, maybe to go on a little bit. This is a picture of the all-white Western Province uh, high schools team of 1983. And you'll see Donald McFarlane in, in the, the middle. There's myself, uh, my brother. Uh, this guy, Dieter Marshall. You may reckon I still plays today, Professor Krevach, who was the team manager, and his son Gerard, who actually went on to become a Rhodes Scholar and Chief Investment Officer at uh, Sunlam Investments as well. I mean, there are about four or five players over there who were over 2,000 soon afterwards or at the time, and Donald was already 2,300 plus. So there's no doubt that, that team is much stronger than the youth teams we have today. And uh, I think it's got something to do with the structure of South African junior chess, that quality players are really not being produced. Um, then just fast forward to 1985. Um, sorry, now before I get there a little bit, I'll, I'll just go back. Uh, we'll leave that there. I remember those days, and you would have seen it by those articles, that there was much more chess written about in the newspapers. There was an article, there's still Nick Bonnet still writes for the Argus, but there was also a regular column in the Cape Times. Um, and they were much bigger, if you look at the space of the articles, than they are today. Nick Barnett wrote both for the Cape Times and the August, but he actually handed over to me on the Cape Times for a period, and I wrote for the Cape Times in about 84, 85. And I remember covering the Kasparov Karpov matches especially, and I used to go into town, I used to go into the Cape Times buildings at nights. I was still only at school, 15 or whatever, and Nick would give me a lift down there 
and then we would wait by the, I don't know what they were called, telex machines, and you wait for the move to come in, and then, you know, wait a few minutes, and uh, three more moves come in. And, uh, yeah, I remember being there when Kasparov became world champion in, in 1985 on that basis. Um, uh, maybe and uh, go forward, okay, 1984 to 87, I was at UCT. Uh, I mean, basically, we used to gather at UCT and play blitz and doubles chess pretty much every day. I didn't actually go to many lectures, I think. What I do remember about that, though, is at one stage, once someone said to me, oh, there's Dion Solomons. Uh, but I'd never met Dion before. Uh, and I must say, Dion never associated with us. So, although he probably would have seen us in the student union, he obviously decided he's keeping, keeping to his own and never, never came near the South African Chess Federation players. Uh, but obviously that blitz helped me a lot because I then won the Western Province Blitz Championship 1984, 1985 and 1986. Uh, I was also the president of the UCT Chess Club at the time. And actually one of the interesting stories I remember, because uh, obviously the ANC was banned at that stage. So one day we had a, like a post box there at UCT, all the different sports clubs and societies. And I went to the post box and I opened it up and there was this huge amount of ANC material, like uh, posters. And so it had been, Leslie, you at UCT, or uh, maybe you know about these stories. It was posters and uh, stickers and uh, banners and flags. So obviously this was just a, a way of getting material into the country. You just send it to the chess club or the soccer club or the badminton club and hope that someone does something with it. So I didn't know what to do with all this stuff because you could be arrested in those days definitely for that. So I just went to the student union and put it on the tables and left and maybe that, I didn't know what else to do. Um, I do remember uh, uh, CAPSA in those days. Uh, so I mentioned the Dion story and Shabir, I mean Shabir loves his chess so much he couldn't resist playing on both sides of the fence. So he played for both sides but he used to play as Dr. Abrams for the South African Chess Federation. Uh, and. Uh, uh, once I played the 1984 Western Province Open at the Cape Sun, and I remember playing this unrated player, Michael Latukhan, and I was really, I was about 2050 at the time, and I was really struggling to beat this guy. I realized, no, he must be, he's quite a strong player, but he's unrated, he's never played before. But afterwards I found out no, that's Malcolm Fredericks. Okay, now I know his real name. So he was also playing under two names. And there was a chap, Alexander Nieva, from uh, the South African Chess Federation, who did it the other way. He used, I can't remember what name he used, but he used to go play in the Capsa tournaments. Uh, uh, as well. Uh, yeah, 1986, uh, I shared the Western Province Open and Western Province closed with Cyril Steele, who obviously son became a very strong player uh, afterwards. So I had, I had three titles. I had Western Province Open, Western Province closed, and the Blitz title at the same time. And that's kind of when we went up to 1986 to play the South African Open in uh, Johannesburg. I came second there to Mark Levitt. But I think those were the tournaments where we suddenly saw the emergence of uh, Watu and George Michalakis as the youngsters that we spotted. These are strong players coming up. Although I played Watu in that tournament and I, I could beat him technically at that stage by just uh, getting a, night versus, a good night versus a bad bishop, but uh, he, they, clearly they were on the way up. And actually the next ESA Open in 1988, which I won in Port Elizabeth, those two were 15 years old and they came joint uh, second. Uh, and soon after they were right at the top of South African chess. Uh, Another story I remember from the mid-80s was the chess musical in 1985 became famous uh, worldwide, you know, with the ABBA guys uh, writing it and Tim Rice, etc. and it was played all over. So they had a big competition uh, uh, to celebrate the, the album and one night in Bangkok, etc. And basically the competition was a knockout throughout the country and the winner would get a trip to Bangkok. And so I won the Cape Town knockouts and I got flown up to Joburg to play, and I got to the semi-final, uh, and I had a friend, Harry Joffe, in Joburg, and we decided if either of us win, because it was a trip to two to Bangkok, and we'd never been overseas before, we would take each other. And basically, he was in the final already, and I was playing Mark Rubri in the semi-final, and I had a very strong position, so it looked like we were off to Bangkok, but somehow I messed it up, I think I played H6 and messed it up, and Mark... Uh, won that game and won the final and we didn't get any trip overseas and Mark didn't get a trip either because he was trying to avoid the army and he couldn't get, you gave it to your parents. Ah, uh, the other way around, sorry, yes. You should have lost Harry, there, yes, you were rooked down or something, I remember. Okay, sorry, other way around, yes. Um, then in 1985, the Cape Town Chess Club celebrated its centenary 
And there was, that was the last time we had a proper chess festival in Cape Town, and we had a gala dinner uh, as well. Uh, and there was a booklet produced and tournaments, and Charles actually won the tournament. Uh, you know, he's still playing 32 years later. Um, but um, one of the interesting things was done is there was a crossword puzzle. Uh, I'm not sure who composed it. I think, Graham, you may have been involved in this, or maybe you were the guy who solved it. I'm a, it, it is somewhere in the minute book about that. I, I can check later on. But there's the crossword puzzle that was composed specially for the centenary with a chess theme. Maybe something for you to publish in one of your uh, articles, uh, Mark. Um, so I'm going to conclude a little bit now. Just This is pretty much the end of my, my, my time in Cape Town. Cause in, 87, I went to, well, 88, end of 87, I went to live in Joburg for, well, what was 15 years. But just before that, I actually, UCT sponsored a team or helped us go overseas to play tournaments. It was my first trip overseas, and we went to play in England, and I played at Hastings. And I beat uh, Dr. Jana Miles, who was a female player who was married to the English grandmaster, Tony Miles. But communication wasn't that good in those days. So I did tell someone I'd beaten Miles, and then the story got back to Cape Town, and then I got this letter from the Cape Town, the mayor of Cape Town, to congratulate me on my historic victory over the English grandmaster, <laughs> Tony Miles. Uh, and uh, yeah, in 1988, I was living in Joburg at the time, but uh, that's when I won the South African Open for the first time. Maybe just as an example, there was a Sunday newspaper. They also had a regular chess column by a guy, Victor Strugo. And there was also a magazine called SA64 that the SA Chess Federation used to publish. I don't know if it was every month or every second month or something, but it was quite a substantial magazine of 12, 15, 15 pages. So, yeah, we haven't got that today, although obviously there are, are websites. And uh, I will maybe just bring it around. I mean, going to the 90s, um, uh, I think uh, the 1991 tournament, I think you'll be talking to later. But that was a very important tournament uh, to signal unity. And Dion, myself, and my brother came to tie first. And then in 1992, I was privileged to be in the first South African team to go to the Olympiad in uh, um, the Philippines. And uh, last night, we had a commemorative dinner. And you will see five of us from that team, all from Cape Town, were in the team. And you can see, as I said last night, it's Dion, Charles, myself, Lyndon. And Maxwell all day last night, and then I mentioned again that what he was absent last night, and he was absent. He didn't come for the Olympiad as well, although he was in the team. And uh, yeah, that's my story uh, of what I remember from. It was quite an interesting time. Thank you very much.